start off with is explain the difference between what we think of as a bacteria versus a virus. They are completely different in size, how they act, whether they're alive or never actually are living, but we can kill viruses. So David, can you kind of give us an idea about what's the difference? We're, we're very familiar with, I have a bacterial infection or I have a virus, but we usually kind of get those kind of merged and mixed up in the same capacity. Certainly, certainly. I'll do my best. Um, one of the things that uh, we've uh, dealt with throughout uh, this industry and many people are, are used to dealing with trying to clean surfaces for uh, bacteria, say in the kitchen, or uh, remediating buildings from mold growth, is, is these are really, although they're all very microscopic organisms, microorganisms, they are vastly different. They might as well be from different planets. Uh, if we talk about bacteria, they can uh, grow and they can infect uh, and they can sometimes even grow in the, in, in the indoor environmental conditions. Um, you can just uh, uh, inactivate them. Uh, you can make them no longer viable or infectious. Uh, they can die on their own or they can remain dormant for, for a long time. Um, but one of the things that uh, distinguishes uh, the bacteria from the viruses is that you may uh, damage the bacteria so that you no longer detect it uh, by culture, but you can still detect its DNA, its, its, uh, its genetic material. Um, but it may no longer be uh, uh, dangerous to humans. Viruses, on the other hand, you should really think of them more like a landmine. Okay, it's, it's a package of material. It's uh, the RNA. Uh, this is a, a, a reverse transcriptase uh, organism. So it, it, it's packaged with RNA. And that's what you're detecting with most, most of the tests that we're able to look at right now um, uh, for environmental tests. Then it's enclosed in a, what they call a capsid, uh, the, the envelope that, or the, the, the body that holds the RNA. And then you have the envelope, the uh, protein, uh, fatty material that helps it survive under the right conditions and helps it become more infectious to people. Um, on, in that you have receptors and, and, and surface areas that are, are important, but the thing isn't living to begin with. You're not killing it. You may deactivate it. You may dismantle it. Um, and you're going to be able to potentially uh, you know, destroy the, the capsid or the envelope. And then eventually the RNA will, uh, it's very fragile. It will fall apart on its own or be destroyed by the material that you're working at. But the tests are really looking at uh, not viability or, um, uh, or uh, amplification or growth, but literally it's still there. So it's more of just a package, package of information and material and a delivery device and uh, it does not amplify and grow until it gets inside of the host. So you really don't have, uh, you, you have to think of it entirely differently than we are looking at for mold or for bacteria. So hopefully that wasn't too confusing. Slightly, but it's, it was a lot, it, it is a complicated subject. So uh, I appreciate your um, kind of clarifying between the two of them. I think most of us still think the viruses are a bacterial um, in nature, just because it's just, it's an organism is too small for us to see. So we kind of just kind of, uh, you know, clump it together, but we're now learning the, the details and the challenges between the two of them. Anybody yeah. else want to add to that? Yeah. Well, I'll add one other thing here is that viruses are often what we call bacteriophages. They, they often attack bacteria. So that gives you an idea of the, the scale that they are. And often we often, we don't do anything for the bacteria, for the viruses anyway, because <clears throat> there's often nothing we can do for them as far as the infectious nature or to treat them. So uh, they're, they're often um, overlooked and, and, and really not even detectable in our uh, normal practices. I think also we have to uh, remember when, when you talk about the package, this package, this virus, <clears throat> this, this kind of this, this bundle of, of uh, different pieces and parts, it goes into the cell. And where a bacteria is a cell and reproduces on its own and one cell becomes two and two become four, the virus enters the, for, this for our example, the human cell and it recodes that cell and it tells that cell to make more of itself. And the cell 
There's several different ways, I won't get into the details, but essentially it reproduces that virus. So within the cell, there becomes so many of the virus that different things happen. The cell will get rid of them, uh, the cell will burst, and the, all of the replicants, the other viruses that have been reproduced by the cell end up killing the cell and then they leave the cell and they go into the surrounding area, which may be the blood, the lymph, it may be, it may be some other liquid. And then those will in turn try to and successfully infect more human cells and kill those. So a lot of the injury that we're seeing is the death of the cells caused by this, this uh, control of the cells, this overproduction of the virus within a cell. Shedding is a term that's important because it is the release of these virus that have been now produced. So one becomes a million, the million are now shed and they're released into the environment. And ultimately, then that is what our exposure is to. In the case of this virus, it is respiratory. So the virus itself survives best and is designed to live in the, the deep cells of the lung along with the pharynx and perhaps the, the back of the nasal passages. And that's the cells that it reproduces in. So when we're coughing, we're coughing the sputum, the spit coming out of our lungs, trying to clean up these dead cells that are now lining. And what we see the injury is, is the buildup of the fragments of dead cells. And that's what a lot of the damage comes from. The other illness that is associated is the, the body's attempt to repair the damage. And then we end up with a, a buildup of liquid. And in some cases, actual bacterial growth called pneumonia. Uh, and you can be then injured or unfortunately you can die of the bacterial infection as well. So we have this, a series of events happening in the lungs uh, from this infection. Uh, but it's, it's that little virus that's kill, taking over and, and killing the cells of the lungs. That is the major cause of the severe illness and symptoms. So then if we close the loop, we've now shed the virus. And in the process of shedding, now we have our two primary routes of transmission that we need to remind everybody about. That we've got larger small droplet transmission expectorated into the air by sneezing, coughing, and you'll read some things about even speaking. And those are transmitting directly to the respiratory tract of another person previously uninfected. But then we've got the issue of surfaces. And surfaces are going to be a huge topic as business owners try and get back to work, as school systems try and get back to operational. And early on, we really didn't talk a whole lot about surfaces. And they're definitely the secondary transmission vector. But it is certainly a concern that infected people are shedding onto environmental surfaces, which then are touched. And after touching, we touch to the face or some other route of entry. You're on mute. That raises, that raises the specter of the fact that we're dealing with perhaps something uh, slightly different than we're accustomed to in uh, typical indoor environmental remediation work, where we're you know, dealing with viruses Know, th this type of organism as opposed to bacterium or de dealing with fungi. Um, do we have the ability to actually treat, treat a surface or create a surface that is uh, you know, going to be resistant to viruses uh, on that surface for a given period of time? Well, good news, bad news. The good news is we can clean and disinfect. And from what's been put out thus far as research from the slim science that we have, uh, we have data showing that the COVID-19 coronavirus lives longer on hard non-porous surfaces than it does on porous materials. Uh, so great, that's good. Hard non-porous surfaces, we know how to clean, we know how to disinfect. The bad news is we don't have that same level of scientific confidence that we can produce a virus static or a virus resistant material. And the only safe statement right now is that when you've used a disinfectant after cleaning or used a, a disinfectant as a one-step disinfectant and cleaner, it's a snapshot in time and your cleanliness can disappear um, relatively soon thereafter. So if you, uh, if you can see the screen, uh, here's a bit of data, by no means exhaustive, but from a survey um, that I was working on, just trying to see if there are any trends and consistencies, and there really aren't. Uh, our aerosol viability, our ability to remain infectious in the air, 
there's a range um, from a couple of hours to two hours to three hours in the case of both the SARS from 2002 and the from 2020. But I want to point out moving down three days on hard non-porous stainless steel and three to 17 days in that second column, the SARS uh, COV2, that's the COVID-19. The 17 day figure comes from the Diamond Princess cruise ship where we found viable infectious virus. This was reported by CDC in their MMWR newsletter um, that in the staterooms of both pre-symptomatic and asymptomatic and symptomatic passengers. And that happens to also correlate to some studies we've had on influenza, on porous materials. So the, what this is showing us is that, you know, the, at the top of this chart, it's all over the place. What we, what we know is that surfaces are a problem, but we can't assume that everything's okay in two hours to say the way we do with, with measles, um, that we can actually have several days of contagiousness on an environmental surface. Yeah, so that, I mean, that raises, raises the question of, um, you know, what is the effectiveness of going in and cleaning and disinfecting? How, how long does that work? And I know uh, Graham has been, uh, Graham Dick, a new panelist for us uh, from out in Vancouver. Um, he is the director and master trainer for an infection control uh, training group. Uh, welcome, you know, newly joining us, being part of the group. Um, you're, you're de you've been dealing for over 30 years with decontaminating indoor environments and dealing with trauma cleanups, uh, restoration that, you know, and you're, you're an expert and training in that aspect. W what are we seeing that's different here uh, with this COVID situation uh, in, from what we've experienced in past uh, situations like this? That's a great question, Bob. Uh, uh, be before I get into directly answering that question, uh, something I'd like to add to, to the conversation on, on viruses uh, for, the, for the layperson is, is just a size perspective. Um, if you take a cross section of your hair, for those of us that still have a little bit, uh, the size of a, a bacteria cell is, is roughly 50 times smaller than the cross section of your hair. Um, and the size of that viral fragment, uh, that virus, is about 100 times smaller than that bacteria cell. And so when the guys were talking about how the virus penetrates into the cell and then replicates, uh, this is very, very small stuff. And, uh, and when most people have a hard time cleaning what they can see, uh, and thinking that, oh, we can deal all of the uh, And so this brings me to, to what's different this time over other uh, responses to, uh, to cleaning and decontamination. I see a preponderance of reliance on fogging and indiscriminate spraying of disinfectant without pre-cleaning and and really i guess my message today is going to center around uh if pre-cleaning of those high contact surfaces is not a key and foundational part of your process you are not accomplishing nearly as much as you think you are so i mean that that raises the question of what is the order of events or what should be the order of events for us getting buildings back into commission? I mean, are we just, you know, does it, does it make any sense just to hire a contractor to come in and start, you know, fogging a biocide in a building or, or, you know, what are the, what are the pre-assessment steps? How do we actually come up with a game plan? Oh my gosh. <laughs> you know what process drives outcome and, uh, and, and, uh, Restores and especially in this pandemic, there's so much fear and panic around, oh, I have monsters in my house or I have monsters in my store that that people forget process and they rush in. And, you know, the saying fools rush in. And that's what we see constantly is is instant experts where they watched a few Google videos on how to use a sprayer 
and they uh, went to the end list and, and purchased whatever they could get their hands on. And now they're a, a, a viral decontamination expert. Uh, and, and, and yet they forego most of the process that is so important. And, uh, and, and that process starts, starts right at the very beginning with a thorough risk assessment. And there's so many different aspects to a complete risk assessment uh, that uh, I see companies missing on virtually every level. I want to just jump in for a second. So when you say process, um, you look, you're you describing it as two things. You're describing it as a hierarchy of how to assess the conditions, which is something that only a trained professional can do. But the other part of the process, which I think you're assuming, is that um, it, it, you could assess that and still fog the dang room, unfortunately. So um, I want to make sure we address the concept of uh, actual uh, cleaning versus disinfecting. And I'm going to bring up a slide in the background about uh, soap and you can compare it to hand washing as a concept, but let's talk about the, the home or even a commercial environment, the difference between what are we doing with touch points and uh, what are we doing to actually remove conditions versus then trying to uh, sterilize or decontaminate other things that were not easily uh, accessed. Anybody? Well, one of the key... Go ahead, Cole. We need to bear in mind is, and Graham brought up List N. List N is a, is a list created by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, to give everybody a pre-selected group of disinfectants that they believe are going to be effective based on deductive reasoning. In other words, if these disinfectants kill organisms that are normally harder to kill than coronavirus, then they can go on this list. It's intended to give everyone a running start. From there, we can all shop for what are the features and benefits? What are our concerns? What do we want the product to do or not do? So it's not the end all and be all, but it's a great starting point. EPA has done a really good job of not only putting this together, but doing better communication, including hazard communication than I've ever seen them do, uh, and providing information like dilutable versus concentrate versus wipes. They've really put a lot of work into this. The key for the consumer or for the property owner or even the professional is to understand how to use this list because this list is driven by the registration number. That's the key that opens the lock of the door, not the product name. So you have the registration number and you search by that number, especially the first two parts of that number because they're either a two-part or a three-part number. And that will tell you what product is on the list. And then if there are other products with different labels but who, that share that same number, that's okay. That's called a distributor product. These formulas are approved and they can be in a variety of different labels in the marketplace. But remember, the label is the law. In fact, the label is the primary safety and hazard communication device for an EPA registered product, which makes it really kind of unique and different compared to the safety data sheets we rely on for other. Excuse me. <laughs> there are still safety data sheets, but it's the label that is of primary importance. And EPA list N is, it's a great starting point. And then you take it from there in terms of informing a hazard risk assessment and informing what you're going to do in terms of your operating program. CDC is working on and releasing in bits and pieces guidelines that are going to help property owners of various types reopen. Cole, and uh, part of that you read in different places says clean and disinfect or aggressively or intensively or words like that. For the, for the employer, this is going to be a learning curve. They're going to have to know more about disinfectants and disinfection than they ever have before. Well, Cole, how, fogging is simply an application method. It could be applied, could be used for any number of products. How many products on this list actually have fogging or wide area applications uh, included in their label? Well, a lot of them do and a lot of them don't. That's one of the features and benefits you look for. Bear in mind that uh, CDC in 2008 and then in 2013 had some revised language, which talked a lot about how much they disliked broad scale fumigation, as they called it, large, untargeted fogging. And yet at the same time, we can use foggers. I want to emphasize for people, there's a difference between the device and the method. Foggers, misters, can be terrific ways of delivering your disinfectant for the prescribed wet contact time on the surface, which is usually as a good rule of thumb, 10 minutes. Viruses can be killed sooner, but there's an implied level of cleanliness that if we're going to have a clean sanitized surface, 
we're going to try and get everything on there, which is usually about 10 minutes. And foggers and misters are terrific, just like airless sprayers have a terrific role. They, that's where you get some of your highest production rates. Electrostatic, if the user's properly trained, can be really useful. Even foaming can be a really useful technique. Uh, we're experimenting right now with exfoliation followed by disinfection out of the same machines that use things like uh, water vapor blasting and baking soda for large outdoor areas, should there be a need for that. So we can be a little bit agnostic about the delivery method. It's the wet application time to a proper surface, and that includes properly pre-cleaned as necessary. That's what the core message has to be. And how are we going to do that in facilities that are open every day and need to get cleaned frequently? And you know, when do we start seeing hazard communications to workers? When do we see workers empowered to be part of the process so that they can do some of the touch points? And these are a lot of huge issues, societal issues that are going to mean we're going to have to learn a lot more about disinfectants than just the wonky specialists like me. Well, well I want to pause. Mm -hmm. one, wait, wait one second, one second. So you you gave a uh, great information, but it was also kind of orientated towards somebody who's going to be doing the fogging. So if I'm a store owner and you know I'm like hey, I got to get my store cleaned, so uh, of course you know somebody put a flyer on my door already. In fact, there's three of them saying I can clean your space. Um, how would they know? what to really look for, or if they went to this list, which is pretty uh, overwhelming for an average store owner, how do we give advice for somebody who says, I need to make sure my store is cleaned and I didn't just get ripped off by some fake scam? Yeah. Well, can uh, I take that? Oh, sure. <laughs> right. Cole's like, sure, man. Everybody's, Pass it everybody's on. chopping. Can I talk about <laughs> Chuck in the truck? You're welcome to him. Again, oh, second man. in line. You know, this is about choosing a qualified contractor. And, uh, and, and if I was, when I counsel people how to distinguish and discern a qualified contractor from someone that isn't, uh, the first thing is to make sure that they're properly insured. The majority of contractors do not have any insurance for doing this type of work. And, uh, and the type of insurance that's required is called environmental pollution liability insurance. And, uh, and if you are doing a pivot in your company where you have not done viral decontamination or microbiological decontamination of any sort in the past, and you suddenly think that you're gonna call up your insurance broker and purchase this, it's not about writing a check. It's about qualifying and convincing the insurance company that you are in fact qualified through training education of you and your staff uh, to perform these, um, these activities without placing the insurance company in a liable position to have to defend you when you screw up. And so that's the first thing. If the insurance company has underwritten the risk of, of giving you pollution liability insurance, then you probably are qualified because they don't do that easily. If a person doesn't have it, run away, look for someone that does. When that's a similar, Graham, that's a similar thing to the mold uh, remediation industry too. There's tons Absolutely. of contractors out there. New York State puts out a licensing program in, in 2016 for mold licensing, and all it specifies is a limited amount of commercial general liability insurance. No yep. E&O for, for consultants, the assessors, and uh, no pollution requirements. Absolutely. So effectively. You know, every, every asbestos abatement contractor in the market seems to think they're a viral decontamination expert now. And they went out and bought sprayers and disinfectant and they're going at it. And yet their pollution liability coverage covers them for asbestos and lead and regulated hazardous dust that they work in. For them to pivot into the biological world uh, is something that most of them have never done, and uh, and and they're going to be in for a rude surprise if they have to uh, tap their insurance policy. Well, as as Cole mentioned, this is one of the few times I've seen EPA be crystal clear on anything. Um, and in one of their uh, related topics uh, postings uh, on the question of can I use fumigation or wide area spraying to help control COVID nineteen. Um, I'd be glad to share this with you or, you know, put you to the, uh, direct you to the website. 
Their answer is very short and sweet. EPA does not recommend use of fumigation or wide area spraying to control COVID-19. The CDC recommends that you clean contaminated surfaces with liquid products such as those provided on list M to prevent the spread of disease. Fumigation right. and wide area spraying are not appropriate tools for cleaning contaminated surfaces. And Bob, I think that's part of the answer is that the insurance is like a quality control program, right? It, it, it doesn't monitor the output and the output here is the process. So the insurance says, approves something a little bit different than what your client that you just asked to be protected. So the store owner, the shop owner, the bank owner, the apartment complex owner, they want to know what to do. So a contractor can present insurance, but it doesn't mean that they, they understand or will provide that service. So they can do the marketing, the sales, they can pr promote or pitch the fog or whatever method they have, have to do. When in fact, if we go to CDC, the CDC clearly says clean and disinfect. And there's some, there's a lot of good pages and, and information there on, on what that means. And the good thing is it means basic cleaning and disinfecting. It means properly cleaning using known common cleaning methods. This is not something special to clean. You have to do a good job at it. You have to pay attention to details but it is standard cleaning, standard cleaning products, standard cleaning methods. Then once those surfaces are clean and the quality control measure may be visibly clean, it may be nice and sparkly and shiny clean. That may be where we're shooting for. Uh, we don't have to have, even though there are available different testing or laboratory methods, that cleanliness is fairly subjective, but at the same time, it's easy to get three people in a room to agree a surface is clean or it needs to be cleaned again. Wow. Then we move to it's, it's very simple. Just ask him to lick it. <laughs> oh, there you go. Perfect. But, 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 but I think the point to stress here, Scott, and, and Graham hit on that pretty heavy, is that there's a lot of different flavors of indoor environmental contracting work. You know? And, and it's like, just because, just because you may even be, uh, you know, and a bona fide expert at asbestos abatement or lead abatement or mold remediation doesn't quali qualify you particularly to do this type of work. Would you guys all agree? Uh, a, hun a thousand percent. I saw a contractor who sold himself as an expert in being able to disinfect and they showed up with an abundance of PPE and they were very well suited up for something that looked extremely hazardous. And I watched them mobilize and I watched them started to work. And as soon as they started to clean, they immediately failed. And I had to stop the job and to bring them into a room. And I had to reteach them what cleaning was. So they had met all those qualifications and they, they actually went to an extreme with some of their personal protection that as an industrial hygienist, I didn't think was warranted, but they chose to do that. And the client was very impressed. But then when the client watched me quality control their cleaning method, we realized that they were probably cleaning less than 50% of any surface that they were asked to clean. <laughs> you, you know, the towel that they sprayed on one end was being dragged across and, and gooping up what was just clean. The simple things like that, not being able to use a sprayer to, to, to adequately cover, to, to apply coverage to a surface. And, and these are things that should be first and foremost, right? How to clean, how to wipe, how to change out your cloths, how to change out your, your uh, soap or detergent water. Um, do we use multiple buckets? One bucket? It should be. <laughs> you know, it, it seems like it should be simple. Do you wipe down it, or do you wipe up? Do you wipe side and side? So but, but see, that raises a secondary uh, question of what constitutes clean? OK, because our, our, you know, I'm hearing usage of uh, ATP, which is adenosine triphosphate swabs, which is great, right, for detecting uh, organisms that actually have ATP resident in them, such as bacteria and fungi. Uh, but viruses don't have ATP. So it, it, is it, you know, is that a valid methodology to say you've cleaned a surface? Um, I'm hearing rumors that there's a now a swab PCR based one that's going to hit the market like immediately I, you know i've been getting the messages on linkedin so uh for, from the purveyor of that and uh so that's really interesting but so what is the criterion of uh, pass fail here yeah how do you interpret the results well, i think you're getting ahead of yourself bob on on that probably <laughs> before okay. you, before you can address 
testing methods and, and methodology there, you have to first set expectations. And, uh, and, and it, it goes back to what are the expectations? What is the client calling you for? You know, I always say it, any, any dumbass can spray disinfectant, spray foo-foo juice around if you're not promising anything. If there's no expectation of any result, that takes no skill, it takes no training to do that. It takes skill and training to get a result. So people are hiring because they have monsters in their property and they wanna get rid of the monsters. So there's an expectation of a result. So now as a, as, as a service, as an industry, whether you're coming at it from a, uh, as a hygienist that's gonna write the spec and supervise or the contractor that's going to fulfill the service, what are the expectations that are being set for that client? And what I'd like to say is that it's not a zero sum game. This is not about all or nothing. There is no such thing. I think we're all agreed that we cannot make any claims to saying the building is safe. But we can make the claim that we, our activities and process have created a safer environment. But aren't, aren't, aren't contractors currently, or some contractors making those claims? And an audience question here that I think plays right into this, you know, how can a remediation company be held liable for uh, a failed cleaning if we don't really have a criteria for what's passed? What, what, what is the standard we're using here? Well, I, I think one of the things that you're going to find is uh, first do no harm. And uh, I, I had seen many failed attempts at cleaning by actually causing more damage than they, they repaired. Mm -hmm. uh, these chemicals are not, they're not safe. Uh, as I, I, I often say, there's no such thing as safe and effective. If it's, if it's uh, concentrated enough to hurt, hurt the organism you're trying to deal with, then um, it's potentially dangerous to people. And so uh, that's the first thing is I've, I've seen so many instances where overzealous contractors or maintenance staff or homeowners have uh, injured themselves and the other people in the building due to over application, misapplication. You know, we keep, I'll keep going back to this fumigation. We had a, a, a very important critical building in Florida uh, have uh, the fire alarms go off because of a, a fumigation of uh, the, the occupied spaces, which injured the duct work, which set off the, the smoke alarms uh, in, in the duct work. So, so many things went wrong with that. So I want to, yeah, I want to touch on a key point that um, uh, I mentioned Graham's quote, uh, two dumbasses in a truck um, going out and spraying stuff. But what um, Scott pointed out it, it implied was that there should be an industrial hygienist working with these guys, whoever they are, that would confirm that the industrial hygienist won't, to, won't even talk to them if they're not actually qualified. But um, one of the things that I'm getting from this is that if somebody's going to come to spray my facilities, I want to ask who was their industrial hygienist, because that confirms that they had somebody else confirm their process and confirm the chemicals were applicable for what I needed. So I think that's one of the key questions that's kind of stumbled through here is that who is, who is their partner? So th th these two guys with, with the sprayer should have somebody else that'd be a key question as to what kind of, who is your industrial hygienist? Um, and that kind of clarifies whether or not they're, they're doing the right job. I'm going to play devil's advocate too here. Do, is an industrial hygienist required on these projects? And I know we have two industrial hygienists on the panel here today. And I just want to ask that question because in the pre-show, we, we actually did have that discussion. And is that, is that the actual, is that the criteria? Well, I think it, from the point of view of the company providing the service, they should have already either employ in-house or have contact and, and, and consulting with someone who can do the role and play, perform the functions of an industrial hygienist. Uh, and, and the reason is because of the way industrial hygienists look at the situation, if, if they're good at what they do. And it's not just a hygienist, it, because a lot of people have sort of assumed that name. Uh, it is someone who understands risk and exposure and the pathways. Some of our contractors are very well educated, and, and we mentioned this earlier on the show, is, is there someone who's good enough to play that role? You know, so, so and, and there are a few, right? There are a few 
owner operators. There are a few supervisors who aren't really industrial hygienists, but they play the role very well and they can answer the right questions. Um, and, and it goes to what is a risk assessment. And earlier, someone said, I think it was Graham, process drives the outcome. And I, I followed that up with, and the goal drives the process. And uh, Graham then discussed expectations. So the goal and the expectations are the same. So the question becomes, what are we doing? We're looking at certain surfaces that are these high frequency touch surfaces. We want, and, and actually even the low frequency touch surfaces for this particular situation. So we have to be careful that it's not just high touch, it's all the surfaces that probably will be touched throughout the day. Yeah, by, I think the key by is the occupants. Right. Said, if they're good at what they do. And <laughs> unfortunately, you've got to shop for, for your hygienist the same way you shop for point. anybody else. Yeah. And, and we have to remember that to to label yourself, call yourself, hang out a shingle as an industrial hygienist uh, requires absolutely nothing. There is no uh, there is no uh, protection in that term. Right. And unfortunately, there are other informational resources I want to point out because we talked about EPA's list N. The other thing is if you have the EPA registration number, EPA makes all those labels public. So you can go online and read the label. And people are always amazed when I bring them through and show them where to find this information and how to do it. And they go, hey, it's all right here. I mean, reading these labels, you don't have to be a certified industrial hygienist. You well, can look at the label. I mean, you brought it up before. You know, how do I know I can use it for fogging? Well, it's going to tell you if you can use it for fogging. And if there's any gray area, you call the manufacturer. And if the manufacturer doesn't have someone who's competent, who can explain that gray area and give you an idea of whether it's a yes or no answer, then you might want to look somewhere else. You know, chemicals are not intuitive. This is the problem. You can pick up a hammer and a hammer is a hammer. And you can tell by holding your hand if it's a good hammer. You can't do that with a liquid and a jug. And trial and error is a really expensive way of doing things. So you need resources like the EPA published pesticide product label database where you can read it for yourself. Well, and most people stop at their uh, uh, hazard assessment by looking at the safety data sheet for a product. That's not the place to go. That is a... Wait, yeah, I want to clarify. So yeah, we, we need to, to, we need to define this because this is an uh, Yeah, wait, wait. So, so safety data sheets are about the installer not about the poor occupants that have to the live worker. in that. The worker. The right. worker, that's right. So, sorry, the worker. So whoever's actually handling that product, that's what a safety data sheet is designed for. Uh, those who are working that, uh, that chicken uh, you know, distributor or that restaurant, that SDS sheet was never intended for them, except as an emergency from something that was installed. So there could be other factors that could be Im implied for the occupant that aren't part of the SDS sheet. Um, well, Joe, you make a great that. point, but the problem with the label is the label's also oriented toward the process of when I'm using the product. So if I get asked correctly, example, correctly, well, your product says all I have to do is let it air dry. And that's, do I have to do anything else? Do I have to wipe? Will it off gas? Well, the answer is, if there were other health and safety considerations, EPA would follow those through on the label to the end. So after that, it's about, well, if you, if you believe there's a residue, talk to the manufacturer about the residue. And is the residue anything to be concerned about? Do you need to wipe in certain applications? Bear in mind, for example, food, any food related application often requires wiping and rinsing. But a lot of other just general use applications are air dry. So, so that, that raises another question, and actually, right? Um, and actually, yeah. there are products that are no rinse for food. We have we have no rinse disinfectants available, but it has to say it on the label and it will say FDA approved. So there, everything, like you said, is on that label. But what's, what, what's interesting here, and I think it's an interesting point to bring up, though, is that, you know, we're we're doing this predicated on the list that EPA generated, which is, you know, the EPA N list. Right. And it's Cole and I in the pre-show talked about this, you know, the, how do they, how do products get on that list, right? Using the swag, right? Um, the swag methodology, because none of these products have really been tested, right? Against this particular coronavirus. And won't be for 18 months, two years, maybe. Look, we can't test against it. This is a data-driven process. When you have an emerging organism, which I want to remind everybody is not just a new organism. It can also be an organism that was never a problem before and suddenly has become one. Uh, so it might be actually something we already know. But we have to go to the lab, test against it, show that we've got a certain level of kill reduction 
of the, of the virus or of the bacteria or of the fungi. And then we can apply to EPA to say, we'd like to add this organism to our label. So in two or three years, you'll see COVID-19 or some name thereof on EPA registered product labels. And oh, by the way, in Canada, the process isn't all that different. Um, so, but it's gonna be a while. Nobody right now should be claiming their product is EPA approved. Nobody should be claiming their product is EPA registered for COVID. Nobody can, all they can say is that they were among the products selected for list N if they're on there. I just ran into a product yesterday from Australia that is being imported here where it says sanitizer with an S, which was kind of a big clue, that uses a chemical approved by the EPA for list N for COVID-19. Well, let me stop you there. The word approved, EPA doesn't approve any products. That, FIFRA, right, the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Redundicide Act is not an approval process. It's a registration process. So you know, EPA doesn't endorse products. EPA doesn't approve products. They register and products. CDC, and Bob, I think the important thing is to realize what you just said. These, and, and what Cole was saying, none of these products have been tested against this particular virus. In addition, there is nothing that I can find yet that requires someone to use only a product from list N. And if we go to CDC, CDC has a, a very short list of recommended products that are effective disinfectants. And it starts with bleach in a diluted form. It goes to alcohol and then it goes to list products that are most likely to achieve success, including those on list N. That's a paraphrase, but it's pretty good. I would point out EP, CDC has been updating their sites a lot lately uh, on the 26th and on the 2nd and on the 14th, there were a series of updates. And now you're seeing list N in the CDC websites a lot more frequently. Well, it was, and it was there two or three weeks ago also, right? They, they did, they've, it wasn't ignored, but it was in the short list. And yep. that is my point. The list end is not a be all end all, nor is it, are you limited to it? And I think that's, that's critical because it moves us away from having to say or accept the fact that quote, it was approved by EPA, as we just mentioned, Bob and, and, and Cole both mentioned that. So I think we have to be very careful when we're teaching contractors or when we're advising a client or a, or a, or a facility on how to choose, right? Maybe they want to do it in-house and, and maybe they don't have access to some of the products. We, you know, I think products, the, the marketplace has caught up somewhat, but for a while we were out of pretty much everything. It was, it was difficult to find anything. But the simplicity was you could find bleach everywhere. You could find alcohol, and if you knew how to safely, you could find gasoline everywhere too, Scott. I mean, come on, you know that, that's that's and that's my concern with with products because I heard that after Hurricane Sandy too, New York City Department of Health recommending using bleach everywhere because it's readily available and it's inexpensive. You know, so is gasoline. Uh, okay, wait, wait. I, I want to move us to uh, we, we've been talking chemical, chemical, chemical. So I want to move to. Uh, I, again, I'm, I'm the business owner. That's why I came to kind of think about that. So my business has been closed for three weeks. The doors have been closed, locked. Nobody's gone in there at all. The longest we know anything has survived is 17 days and it diminishes over time. Those are all the things that are very commonly uh, accessible. So why do I need to go have my restaurant cleaned before I decide to open the doors and let people back in? So that you have a rebuttable presumption when someone files a claim against you? Well, I, here's the other side of it. I, I'm not sure that this one-time deep cleaning is going to achieve anything. Um, really, what you what we're advising to our clients are you need to implement ongoing, intensive, yes, every day throughout the day cleaning and disinfecting of the high touch areas and daily cleaning and disinfecting of the low touch areas. Your your level of of uh, custodial and maintenance and cleaning and disinfection needs to go from what was often down here to up here. I mean, you know, and, and that's the most protective and risk uh, and, and best of most likely to mitigate the risk as you move forward, both with your employees, your customers, your vendors, you have to assume every person walking in that door is infectious. Once you put that in your mind and you can go to bed with it and understand we are constantly cleaning up after people and their viruses that they're shedding to reduce the risk. 
So what is the bigger source? What is the bigger source? It, are we worried more about the environmental surfaces or are really the, the human occupants and the, the people coming in and out of the buildings the vector that we you have to, you and have how to do we address that? Wait, so I want to clarify. So if I just spent a lot of money cleaning my restaurant, okay, <clears throat> I'm assuming it's only good until the first person with some type of issue comes in and touches something or sneezes. And then right. everything I spent all my money on is kind of worthless until I clean again. Is that a correct statement? Yes. It's like trying to clean your clean your kitchen once a day. It's, it's very much like behavioral safety. When, when behavioral safety became kind of a, a favored method of, of uh, changing uh, the practices, safe practices in a workplace. It's the same thing. We have to change behavior. Fortunately, we've had many weeks now for our entire society, our world, to realize we have to change some behaviors. So when we do come back for your restaurant that you want to reopen, everyone is now very aware of some of these things. So what you as an employer ought to do is be able to develop a program that instills some of the behaviors that will help your facility based on your simple risk assessments of where people are and what they touch and what they do to be able to repeatedly clean and address those services and respond. Uh, if, if a very sick person comes in and is sitting at one of your tables and has a coughing attack, do you clean that table differently than you clean the rest of the tables all day long? So these are the thoughts that an owner ought to be considering and maybe developing responses for in addition to the daily activities of each employee. And I'll and share then, a couple of really then, like nitty gritty first. things the owner can do. Um, use secondary use labels that are provided by the manufacturer and put them on your containers, on your spray bottles, on your pump up sprayers. Contractors should do this, but also owners should do this. And any good manufacturer of a disinfectant is going to make those available for free. Uh, wipes. Wipes are great on touch points. They're great for empowering employees to tr try and be part of the solution for taking care of touch points. But here's a couple of problems. First of all, the market for wipes is struggling to keep up with the demand for wipes. So they're really hard to get. So you might have to improvise and make your own. And there's nothing wrong with doing that, but just think about how you're going to do it. Also read the label, because sometimes it's really hard to get a 10 minute wet contact time with wipes. Uh, they can be kind of problematic that way. And they sort of lead to false expectations of effectiveness. Well, so let's pivot to this, because I think we actually just fringed this, this topic uh, from a couple of aspects. Uh, you know, we've, I think we all agree that there has to be a, a good, uh, accurate uh, risk assessment. If we don't do that up front, we, we really don't know how to handle the situation. But now how do we deal with uh, the training uh, aspects for, you know, both, because I think there's clearly a difference, right, between frontline staff, support staff, people out there handling biocides in quantity and spraying it around and fogging it, people that may not have done it. And I'm talking maybe even from the facility management side, you know, versus somebody that's, you know, a back support staff person. What are the, what are the training aspects we should be looking at? I know, Graham, this is something that's near and dear to you. Okay. Um, going back to, uh, you know, Joe, Joe owns a restaurant and he's looking at what, what is he going to do to, to create a safe environment that's going to encourage his patrons to come back and, and, and eat at his restaurant. Um, it starts with, it, it starts with uh, you know, the hygiene of the staff uh, from the moment they enter the building. So you're going to have steps where as your staff come to work, the very first thing they do is they wash their hands. And, and scrub up properly. Uh, the, the, before they even enter the building, uh, the assigned person's gonna take their temperature. And, and, uh, and, and just like uh, this is something that is happening now in, in, in various countries in Asia where they're reopening society and most retail places, most restaurants uh, the line at the door starts with getting everyone's temperature taken. If you're showing a temperature, you're not coming into my restaurant. The next step is washing your hands. Everybody gets a wet wipe uh, and some hand sanitizer on entering the restaurant. Uh, and now you have a measure of safer activity for protecting your restaurant from contamination people that uh, the chance or odds of someone that isn't already uh, showing a, um, uh, running a temperature of coughing in your restaurant or sneezing in your restaurant is, is significantly reduced. 
uh, with everybody going in and having starting their experience in the restaurant with clean hands uh, reduces them bringing something into the restaurant that they had on their hands when they went from, from uh, traveling there. Uh, and then the increased hygiene of your serving staff uh, the increased hygiene of your kitchen staff. Your kitchen staff may be wearing a, a N95 while they prep food and so forth. That might be a, a new normal. Um, there's a, the, but if you start thinking it through and go, how as a restaurant owner, am I going to give people the confidence to come back to my restaurant and feel safe spending an hour or two here drinking and enjoying each other? Uh, and, and, those I think are practical steps. Then you move to how do you, uh, once you've improved the hygiene of your staff and of your uh, guests, then the next thing is addressing what are the increased hygiene procedures for maintaining my facility. And so I like to, use the same kind of analogy as they do in your hospitals of having your red, yellow, and green zones, your, your hot and warm zones and your cold zone. And so your cold, cold zone is a controlled environment where, uh, where you don't have anyone unknown entering that environment. Uh, so your kitchen, your prep area, that would be a controlled environment where only your staff go. But if it's the if it's the washrooms and the uh, and so forth, you know, you may go. Okay, we've got multiple washrooms. We can't risk our staff going into a washroom that the public is using, and then there's all kinds of viral shedding in that washroom, and then my staff get contaminated and catch something and start passing it around to the other guests. So what you wanna do probably is you want to make one washroom, if you don't already have it, a staff washroom, right? It's because that's controlled. You're controlling your staff in a way that you can't control your guests. And so you start to make these different small steps and it's not that any one of them is a cure-all, it's the combination of all of it that is going to create a safer environment. I mean, that seems like great advice. Where, where, where does a, you know, a building owner operator, you know, some business owner, where, where are they going to find this information? Because this is great. You're, you're an industry expert in training, you know, environmental aspects. And all of us here on the panel are all well-versed in this, but you know, the actual, you know, like a restaurant owner or a, a small retail shop owners, of, where, where do they go to find this information? We need to come to the Healthy Indoor, indoor Show and they're going to listen to Bob as he moderates uh, a panel of experts. We need indoor, we need on demand learning. We need on demand bilingual learning in small, modular, digestible bits that are easy to use for training. And that should really start with our professional restoration organizations that are so multi skilled. And, you know, there's a lot of different associations uh, associated with cleaning. And it's really going to be a question of who steps up, you know, who steps up first and who, who tries to build a coalition to say, let's do some cooperative education so that everybody is represented and we end up with an end product that's going to serve everybody. But it's going to have to be on demand. It's going to have to be through the screen. Uh, there will be a certain amount of classroom that we can do, but there'll be more demand than we have classroom available. There's I mean, clearly this has to happen in real time to, to address this current pandemic. I fear, and I, I unfortunately, I think I'm probably right. This isn't going to be the last time we face this sort of uh, situation on this planet. Yeah. I, you know, this has been predicted for a long time. Th these things have happened before. Uh, I, I've read many places that typically one to two times a century, you know, a global yeah. pandemic isn't all that uncommon. Three, three per century. And last century, we had like one and a half. So we're like a dormant volcano and the time has come. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, so we're almost out of time. I just want to uh, just mention that we um, we're going to do an overdrive here for an additional thirty minutes. So we will end our our regular portion of the show, and uh, we'll 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 keep on online and actually uh, continue drill down to some deeper topics uh, that we uh, we tried to cover today. We really tried to cover an awful lot of content in sixty minutes. Uh, but I I will say the one question I've had and in, in the discussions with you guys in, in pre-show. 
is where's OSHA? You know, where's OSHA? Because yeah, in, that, in previous in years, Bob. Okay, but right now, you know, it, it just seems like it's kind of an absent thing. It seems very, very quiet on the OSHA front. Well, OSHA and CDC, I see as far as th this subject, reopening buildings, you know, the ancillary hazards, you know, the things we're also seeing with waterborne pathogens that we expect to see an issue here. They're pointing back to previous documents that were not written, not considered uh, as part of this issue. And they're, I don't know, playing a bunch of the, the, the oldies, you know, old, favorite oldies. Uh, but I don't see them leading in this area or, or taking either thought leadership or, or industry leadership. OSHA needs to step up. I mean, this is now moving into the employee workspace as we reopen and we're going to be teaching disinfection and sanitizing and workers are going to have legitimate questions about what's being used, how it affects them. So OSHA can get dragged along and be reactive or they can step up and be proactive. And I don't think there's any choice, but they seem to think there's, a, there's an option. I'm kind of concerned with the fact that it seems like there's directives uh, from the Department of Labor, you know, that... Um, they're not, you know, they're only going to have reporting done by uh, medical practitioners and frontline type companies and, the, you know, general companies, it seems like there's kind of, well, they're not going to be required to report COVID cases and because that would be burdensome. And I, I agree it could be burdensome, but isn't it kind of important? Well, I want to know why CDC is the one responding, is the agency responding to the Smithfield plant closure and cluster and it's not OSHA. And OSHA's not there with them. This isn't clearly, it, it's affecting both, but, um, you know, I don't think anybody can make a, a, a straight faced argument that this was not uh, an occupationally uh, uh, centered cluster. So how are we going to, how are they going to respond to this? Are they simply just saying, hand it over to public health? Well, I, I think the question, I think the question is what is pragmatic and what is the injury? The injury is it's public health oriented. It is a disease. A disease is not an aspect of the workplace. So OSHA in, in practical terms is not involved in public health. Public health is involved in public health. It, it, OSHA is not involved in a transmittable disease. So it's a, it's a gray area in between when we talk about are we disinfecting and using chemicals and, and disinfectants and biocides, or are we just sharing a disease with each other because we happen to work on the same, you know, assembly line? Well, it's a known hazard, and there are steps that that employer can and should have taken to mitigate that hazard. So... Even if it's a that's disclosure, that's even, even disclosing that, you know what, this is, if, even if they just said, this is not ours you should go there. It's a statement where right now we have nothing to even uh, clarify where somebody should go as to what their responsibility is or what somebody else should go to find the solution. No, and the best way to not have that as a problem is you don't count the, you don't count the bodies. And you mentioned, David, you mentioned that four weeks ago in uh, one of the earliest shows we did on this of, uh, you know, and it's a prediction that I fear is coming to pass to some extent. The less counting, less counting you do, the less uh, right. you have to acknowledge it. Less yeah. tests there are, the less people have it. The, the, I, I, I can. Uh, there have been many outbreaks that have been stopped by stop counting the bodies. I mean, I would, I would question that. I've been watching the Johns Hopkins site. I, unfortunately, I think uh, somewhat habitually for the last month, and uh, I, I, I've taken a strange notice of the fact that China has only had about 300 cases reported of COVID-19 in the last three weeks. And I find that hard with there's a billion people that have had 300 cases. When in New York State, we're going over 200,000. We're over 200,000 in my state. We're, we're under siege. Really? Yeah, well, I mean, it, w there, there, there could be an issue of uh, a full disclosure, so I, I don't want to waste much of our time with no, our group here. So, right. <laughs> you know, so, so th that's the end of our actual regular show time. So, um, I just want to mention that uh, you can you can get uh, access to the show. You can see uh, copies of uh, all of our back issues of Healthy Indoors Magazine, the digital edition. It's free online worldwide. You can get to all of that all at healthyindoors.com. Uh, we also now have uh, the Healthy Indoor Show as a podcast. So, hey, you can even listen to uh, all of us, Joe and the rest of us, uh, speaking while you're driving in your car. That'll be fun. Um, so that's uh, that's available uh, to you um, anytime, anywhere, anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm.